four to four and a half percent, whereas India and Bangladesh have been on the right side of six and a half to seven percent. Over a hundred million people of my country have gone below the poverty line, and the unemployment rate in this country is approaching nine percent. And the exports of India are close to fifteen to twenty times more than that of Pakistan. Pakistan, we were at one stage one of the largest textile exporters. Now, of course, even Bangladesh is more than twice export of garment. Hello and welcome to Infer Talks, a podcast where we put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world. Joining me today is a former dean of the School of Social Sciences and the current professor emeritus at the Beacon House National University. He had also served as Federal Minister of Finance, Commerce and Economic Affairs and Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission. My guest today is Dr. Hafiz Pasha. Dr. Hafiz Pasha, welcome to Infer Talks. Thank you. Uh, sir, let me go ahead and start our conversation. And my first question is, what are some of the most perennial issues that you see economists today and the ruling elite continue to face you know, in a more chronic manner uh, than ever before? Bismillah rahman rahim Well, Pakistan, unfortunately, has been confronted with a series of structural problems for the last many years. And unfortunately, we have not been able to take sufficiently strong measures and reforms to bring back the economy to the path of uh, more or less rapid, inclusive, and sustainable growth. What are those uh, structural problems? The one which currently dominates is the huge imbalance that we have between Pakistan's exports and Pakistan's imports. I mean, there have been years when our imports virtually were more than double the level of exports. Now, clearly that is unsustainable because it leads to a very large trade deficit, which uh, to some extent, Pakistan fortunately has been able to finance through the increasing and large inflow of home remittances. But there are years when the gap becomes too large and two years ago, we had a gap of almost 17 and a half billion dollars in a current account deficit, which led to a massive depletion of the foreign exchange reserves of a country. And since June last year, there has consistently been talk about whether Pakistan will be able to survive, will default or not. So this is perhaps the single most important uh, constraint and structural problem Pakistan faces. The other problem that this country has had for many, many years, also simultaneously, is a very big gap between the levels of investment in Pakistan and in other countries. Pakistan, with great difficulty, manages to invest every year, both public and private, about 15% of its GDP. And that clearly has an impact on its growth rate. As compared to this, India and Bangladesh the other two major South Asian countries are able to achieve almost double that rate at about 30% of the GDP. And that is why over the last decade or so, Pakistan has managed a growth rate of hardly four to four and a half percent, whereas India and Bangladesh have been on the right side of six and a half to seven percent. So that is the other big constraint. Then finally, I would like to highlight the emerging constraints with respect to what is happening to Pakistan. And these relate to the new changes and the new problems that are coming up. And the first one to me is climate change. Climate change and particularly the warming globally is beginning to have a serious impact on the glaciers in Pakistan and leading to big outflows of water down the Delta region and that has created enormous problems of floods. We have had the worst floods in Pakistan's history last year when we lost, the economy lost $30 billion. So these are among some of the most serious problems. And finally, let me conclude by, on these problems by highlighting that today, last year was a year of very difficult performances. Uh, GDP has contracted and I'm, 
sorry to say that today, over a hundred million people of my country have gone below the poverty line. This has never happened before. And the unemployment rate in this country is approaching 9%. Last year, 2 million workers lost their jobs. So the social uh, platform on which this economy functions has become weaker and weaker as we move along. Dr. Hafiz Pasha, you actually cited examples of Bangladesh and India who've been able to sort of you know, manage and raise the foreign direct investments ratio to their overall GDP. Let me then ask you, what exactly have these two countries done differently than Pakistan, which has enabled them to kickstart growth in their economy and in a very endured manner? What's the difference between Pakistan versus these two regional countries? The biggest difference, it seems to me, is in their export performance. Bangladesh, about 20 years ago, used to have exports just about half that of Pakistan. Today, Bangladesh's exports are over twice that of Pakistan. And the exports of India are close to 15 to 20 times more than that of Pakistan. So there has been success in terms of efficiency, in terms of building markets, in terms of controlling quality and so on and so forth, much more in these two countries than unfortunately Pakistan, we were at one stage one of the largest textile exporters. Now, of course, even Bangladesh is more than twice export of garments. So the problem is basically that Pakistan has not invested adequately in modernization of its industry and making it more competitive. And the other constraint is that we are now increasingly seeing infrastructure limitations, but earlier on, it was the electricity uh, supply. We had massive load shedding for many years. Now it is the cost of electricity, which is reducing our competitiveness. The other unfortunate problem I would say, and perhaps to me, one of the most important failures has been the demise more or less of the cotton crop, which is the single most important raw material for our exports. Over the last 15 to 20 years, cotton, through some very injudicious and uh, interest-driven politics, was replaced by sugarcane. And today, Pakistan needs to import almost 40% of its requirements of cotton. You'll be truly amazed that after independence, Pakistan was a major exporter of cotton to India. Today, Indirectly or otherwise, Pakistan is a major importer of cotton from India. That is the extent to which our agricultural sector has not been able to cater to the export needs of our country. So speaking of the agricultural sector, I will come to the, you know, the, the cost of electricity production and distribution in Pakistan. But speaking of the agricultural sector, and you did mention about uh, you know, the, the cotton uh, the cotton crop itself. Do you think is there any way to woo the agricultural sector or to say the farmers to reshift their focus from sugarcane and bring them back to, you know, encouraging them to uh, reproduce cotton in Pakistan? Well, if we can surmount the vested interests which have dominated uh, the policy making in the agricultural sector over the last. Uh, many years, yes, the first thing we need to do is, you'll be amazed, there was a period about 10 to 15 years ago when the support price for cotton was withdrawn. So cotton, which is a risky crop in terms of its vulnerability, uh, was uh, increased because there was no guarantee of a cotton price to the farmer. Instead, the sugarcane price was consistently being raised and the crop made more attractive uh, you must realize also that sugarcane per acre needs three times as much water as cotton. And yet we went for sugarcane. Now what do we need to do? Fortunately, the government has restored the last few years the cotton support price. And this year we have offered a good price. And we need to, uh, uh, however, now go to the uh, other extreme of withdrawing the support price for sugarcane. Pakistan does not have a comparative advantage in sugarcane cultivation. 
So we move out of sugarcane and increasingly move towards cotton, back it up with adequate fertilizer pricing and also with adequate credit, particularly to the farmers in South Punjab where much of the cotton is grown. So if we go with a proper set of economic and financial policies, we should be able to once again come back to about 14 to 15 million bales of cotton. This year, after the floods, we'll be lucky if we get 6 million bales only. So, sir, you do understand that it is a vulnerable crop in the first place. And certainly it can face a lot of you know, vulnerabilities uh, when, in fact, we have such a rise in climate-induced hazards. So then let me ask you, as a policymaker or as, a, uh, you know, as someone who does advise uh, you know, government and practicing economists, don't you think it would be a much timely measure to introduce a measure such as um, you know, some kind of an insurance policy to encourage all such kind of producers to go ahead and at least have some backup plan if, God forbid, you know, they end up having uh, untimely uh, you know, rains or any other calamity which might pose a risk to, to the farmer's uh, crop production? It's a very good point. What we need to do is to develop a resilience and action plan against climate change. And Pakistan, I must say, must give due credit to our government, has been working on Pima and other such programs. To, and we were fortunate that when we went for the conference on financing of the flood <clears throat> reconstruction, we were able to mobilize about nine to nine and a half billion dollars. Some of it diverted from other projects. Nevertheless, there is a realization globally that Pakistan is one of the more vulnerable countries. We have to give top priority to investment in flood mitigation and management. The other thing that we need to do is very quickly, Pakistan must now begin to focus on some measures of crop insurance. This is something we have never really worked on, but somehow or the other, many countries have developed systems of crop insurance at relatively low cost, and that should be built into the financial arrangements, particularly with the medium-sized and large farmers. Now, Dr. Afiz Pasha, now let me ask you and uh, you know uh, table this question that you raised about the cost of electricity itself. Thankfully, unlike the previous decade, we've been able to overcome our perennial uh, you know, power supply issue. However, the government has recently decided to raise the electricity tariffs in order to, as it claims, to overcome its circular debt. Do you think, is it just because of the tariff prices itself that is co contributing our you know, uh, you know, chronic circular debt issue, or is there something more to it? Well, this is a very fundamental uh, question, and I'm, I appreciate your asking this because some of us refer to the power sector as the black hole of Pakistan's economy. And why is that the case? Today, the circular debt of the power sector, if we get the latest estimates, will begin to approach. 3 trillion rupees, believe it or not. This is a huge amount, and it has built up rapidly over the last four to five years. Now, there are ample reasons why this has happened. Uh, Pakistan today has one of the largest losses in the sector, in the world. Our transmission and distribution losses approach 17%. And our billing losses are close to 8%. So you add them up totally, your losses are close to 25%. This You can never sustain a sector with this kind of losses. The other problems we have had is the extremely imbalanced nature of agreements that we signed at the time when we needed investment in the power sector in the 1994 power policy. We offered the IPPs absolutely unbelievable financial terms, which included guaranteed return on the dollar value of capital and no taxation, so on. So that has now become increasingly unsustainable. So the problem is a structural in character, and the government in, under pressure in the short term, particularly from the viewpoint of managing the fiscal deficit, 
which is reaching unsustainable proportions over the last few years, what the government has now done is decided from the 1st of July, NEPRA has decided to raise the tariff on average, believe it or not, by 7.550 rupees, 7 rupees 50 pesos per kilowatt hour. This is equivalent to a one-shot increase of almost 30%. Today, our exports, for example, the textile exporters, we used to have an implicit subsidy in the tariff that we charge them that has been withdrawn under pressure from the IMF. And now with this further increase of seven and a half rupees per kilowatt hour, believe me, believe me, in dollar terms, the price of electricity to our exporters is almost exactly twice the price that India and Bangladesh charge their exporters. And that is clearly going to affect our competitiveness. So, sir, if this is the case, do you think is it possible for any government, either today or, you know, a future government, or I might say it this way, how urgent is it for any government to immediately renegotiate perhaps, you know, its deals with the IPPs, the independent power plant uh, companies, and to also solve Pakistan's one of the long-term issues of, uh, you know, line losses. Is there a way out of it or do you think it's just a vicious cycle we are doomed to repeat? It, 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 this is perhaps one of the single most important questions. As I said, the power sector is the black hole. It has begun to restrict the economy and its financial viability. Therefore, we need to do one or two things on a priority basis. Here again, I would say that our government has taken the right decision to move towards renewable energy and nuclear energy. I think that was very much in the nature of a right decision. It is less expensive and more importantly, it is less dependent inevitably on imports. And today, 30% of our imports are energy related. So that will come down. The other thing Pakistan needs to do is to ensure that our IPPs uh, are given, of course, adequate returns, but we begin to negotiate with some of them to the extent that we have scope legally to do so. But the fundamental step is improved management of the sector. The discos are in shambles. Their losses are huge. And perhaps we might begin to explore the possibilities of either provincializing, as in India, the distribution, or even moving towards privatization of the sector and development of open market wheeling arrangements for greater competition in the supply of electricity to consumers. Dr. Hafiz, we continue to see you know, populism being an inseparable part of our politics. And unfortunately, we've seen it even being practiced not just by the opposition benches, but by also, uh, you know, political parties that form the part of the government as well. We've seen it in the previous governments. We've, we continue to see it today as well. Some of the recent examples include, uh, you know, the government's decision to continue the subsidies over fuel and as well as you know decisions to um, you know delay the much needed taxation on the retail sector what do you have to say about uh, you know this this problem where the political elite sort of gives in to this urge of you know uh, giving precedent to political economy over serious economic governance is there a way that the eco economists who are part of the government can be empowered to the extent that they can at least insulate populism from steering, steering the overall direction of the economic policy? Again, a very useful and a very fundamental question. You see, Pakistan, and I've had the opportunity in three of governments to observe how governments actually function, particularly at the political level. You see, the fundamental problem in a way, in Pakistan, is perhaps even more than populism, is the state capture and the elite capture of the state by the privileged sections of our society. 
So can you please expand these two concepts? I'm sorry for interrupting you. The, st the state. So I'll actor. explain to you. The first thing is in terms of the policies on taxation, policies on pricing of public services, policies on access to credit, policies on access to land and other assets, all are heavily tilted in favor of, if you like, the top 1% of the population of Pakistan, the elite. I will just give you one quick example, if I may. Look at the distribution of farmland in Pakistan. Pakistan today has one of the most unequal distributions of farmland, certainly very much in South Asia. 1% of the largest farmers, the feudal elite, if I can call them that, own 23% of the land, and that too, the land which is most fertile and irrigated. And their annual incomes are close to two and a half to 3,000 billion rupees. Let me emphasize, two and a half to 3,000 billion rupees. And how much agricultural income tax are they paying? With great difficulty, two billion rupees. And how much would that be? How much would that be in percentage, sir? 0.1 percent. 0.1 percent. This is one example of the capture of the tax system by the privileged elite. The other example, which I can, if you like, do very quickly, is urban property. Today we have some of the finest residential localities anywhere in the world. And we have a very extravagant housing standards. Do you know how much we collect from the property tax throughout the country? Urban immovable property tax. The value of the large properties located above one canal, the value of them is close to 4,000 billion rupees. And we are collecting from urban immovable property tax throughout the country 25 billion rupees, which is 0.6%. This is the example of the state capture by the ruling elite of your country. And do you think you, as a policymaker, have had a difficulty in terms of, you know, uh, making that argument or sort of, you know, uh, convincing the ruling elite itself why those two areas should be taxed and what kind of bottlenecks did you face into? Oh, well, at 1997, when I was temporarily managing planning and finance, I was the one who brought the agricultural income tax into the law. And this was an unbelievable accomplishment. And I thank the prime minister at that time, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, for agreeing to do this. The law was brought in, but never implemented. Absolutely. Why is that? Because the power in the local power structure, particularly in the provincial assemblies of the rural elite, the end result is the tax law exists, but there is no collection. This is and the how, problem. And how many years has it been since you last uh, introduced this law? It's been almost 25 years. That's like a quarter of century and we have had this much of an opportunity cost when it comes to, you know, the kind of taxation that could have been generated. And lastly, when I talk about the retail sector, you highlighted the retail sector. You know, the wholesale and retail trade sector of Pakistan is the largest sector of the economy. It has and a share of almost 18 percent of the economy. And within that, our estimates are that about 8% of it at least consists of large wholesalers and retailers. We do have a withholding tax regime to collect some amounts from the traders, but that's limited and certainly at the retail level for the large supermarkets and so on and so forth, we have to now really develop a proper tax administration system, register the transactions and so on and so forth, and we can mop up at least five times as much revenue as we do currently from the wholesale and retail trade sector. But why, why, why is there so much reluctance to, you know, sort of 
bring these three sectors into tax net at all? The agriculture. Because behind the them are politically very influential lobbies. But then the problem is, sir, that we keep on running into these perennial economic problems, and where we and where we sort of do understand uh, in terms of where the solution lies. Yet we're not willing to do that. Why do we need to have, you know, prescriptions from the outside, from organizations like the IMF that has to tell us that, you know, we need to, you know, levy taxes on these so-and-so sectors, or we need to reform so-and-so uh, organizations, public uh, state enterprises to get our house in order. We all know the problems. We know all, and we all know the prescriptions, yet we are reluctant to do that. How do we sort of overcome this issue? Well, you see, the problem actually also has reached a point where something will have to be done, I'm afraid. One of the best indicators of this unsustainability is the fact that out of the net revenues of the federal government of Pakistan, once we cover the liability of interest payments on our debt, we run into a deficit. And do you know that for the first time in Pakistan's history, our entire defense budget is financed by borrowing? How can you sustain this level of strategic defense spending? This is an unbelievable manifestation of the unsustainability of the country's finances. So clearly the time has come that these pockets of uh, state capture by the elite will now have to be tackled. If we don't, then our financial position becomes extremely unsustainable. You will be shocked to know that today Pakistan is going to be spending this year 8,500 billion almost on just paying the interest payments on debt. This is hopelessly unsustainable. And how much would that be as a part or as a portion of our budget? Well, it would be uh, certainly in the federal budget, it will be about 60%. And it will be about at least three and a half thousand billion rupees more than net revenues. That's very tragic. Is, it's unbelievable. I have studied Pakistan's public finances for the last 35 to 40 years. I've served some time in finance also. Never, never has the position been so hopelessly unsustainable when a country finances its defense, which is of top priority in terms of security, through borrowings that is not sustainable. Dr. Hafiz Pasha, and let me ask you a very important question to which you had alluded previously, and that is actually about, you know, the foreign direct investments. Let me ask you, sir, how would you suggest that, you know, Pakistan's governance or the government machinery can be, uh, uh, you know, sort of reformed and made more uh, growth oriented in terms of, you know, uh, making it a friendly, business friendly uh, uh, governance machinery. And by business friendly, I do not mean to say that we need to sort of uh, bring some kind of compromises when it comes to their, you know, regulatory practices or to, 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 to their overall uh, integrity. But what I mean to say is, what is it exactly that we need to do? Do we need to retrain the existing staff? Do we need to change the hiring and evaluation uh, criteria? What do you think exactly needs to be done to bring about that paradigm shift where your governance machinery is more growth oriented and sort of helps both the foreign direct investors and the business community at home in terms of, you know, bringing about economic growth? Again, a very fundamental question. You see, one of the great transformations that has taken place in the structure of economic governance in the country has been that during the decade of the 60s, when Pakistan enjoyed exceptionally high growth rates, and we were way ahead of India at that time, and Pakistan's economy was being managed through the Planning Commission, not through the Ministry of Finance. 
You see, what has happened from the late 70s onwards, Pakistan's emphasis has shifted towards short-run crisis management rather than focusing on achieving sustainable long-run growth. The planning process has more or less completely been demolished. There was a time, in fact, when we used to have five-year plans, and at least up to the second five-year plan, we did a very good job of achieving them. The problem has been that the mindset of the bureaucracy and the political leadership has essentially shifted to short-run considerations rather than focusing on the medium run at least and trying to focus on the structural dimensions of the economy and improvement. That has been one of our big failures and this has become even more pronounced as Pakistan's foreign exchange reserve position becomes worse and worse and the focus becomes more and more literally day-to-day -day driven. There is no focus on the medium to long run today. Now we have had this new investment council which has been established in, through our power structure and they are talking in terms of uh, enhancing the ease of doing business with uh, one window operations essentially particularly for foreign investors now this is a welcome step but for this to happen we will have to clearly improve the regulatory functions and the massive amounts of documentation that are required and with all due respects, the illicit transactions that inevitably take place. How and could they, they be reduced, sir? I'm sorry to interrupt uh, you. How could they be reduced, sir? They could be reduced by stopping human face contact through establishment of proper internet and other arrangements. Pakistan can move to the 21st century in terms of transactions. And very importantly, very importantly, what Pakistan will have to do is to demonstrate that the, there is manageable risk to the finance, foreign investor of investing in Pakistan's economy. Today, Pakistan's economy is in a situation where last year, the repatriation of profits of our existing multinational companies the existing investors from abroad were reduced by 80%. This is not the right environment for promoting foreign investment. So you will have to ensure that you have the necessary financial wherewithal to ensure sustainability of meeting our obligations and other problems. For example, Chinese IPPs, pending payments of over $1.5 billion. We have not paid them. So these are some of the really serious problems. And while this uh, uh, investment council's uh, efforts are trying to mobilize large amounts of foreign investment, particularly from the Middle East in our mineral sector and in our agricultural sector, and also in the IT sector are welcome, they'll have to be based on hardcore realism and on really facilitating one-step window operations. So, Dr. Hafiz Pasha, as a foreign investor, uh, I mean, if you were to imagine yourself as a foreign investor, or perhaps if you're speaking about foreign investors, what are, what are some of the signals that they might be looking at in order to go ahead and make their move in terms of making an investment in Pakistan? What are some of the two to three things would, would they be looking at on an immediate and short-term basis when it comes to Pakistan as a potential market? What are the potential profitable opportunities? And in this, as I have said, Pakistan's mineral sector is promising. We have unexplored vast deposits of very valuable minerals and that needs to be emphasized and focused upon and projects developed around it. Second, what they will look at is, as I said, the flow of funds, both into and out of Pakistan. At this time, we have this constraint of outflow, as I've told you, in terms of repatriation of profits. And the third, and if I may emphasize the risk factor, relates to the law and order situation, particularly in areas where we have minerals. There continues to be the risk of uh, attacks, and you've seen recently what happened in the frontier, 
and earlier on in Balochistan, uh, particularly in Balochistan where we have sizable deposits. So there is the risk factor associated also with acts of terrorism. So we have to be aware of all these limitations and we would expect the National Investment Council to take steps accordingly to improve the environment. So, sir, let me ask you once again, sort of like rope in your experience as 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 someone who's served in various positions as a minister. Uh, what are some of the frequent problems that you would run into, uh, you know, as a leading economist or as a minister? And what challenges did you really face in that position? Well, I was brought in into finance immediately after the bomb explosion. And we were very close to a, a, a difficult position because the Americans had imposed unilateral sanctions in Pakistan and we were denied access to the IMF. So we spent sleepless nights for a few weeks and months, but God willing, Pakistan was managed to uh, <clears throat> get out of this with the help, particularly from, I want to place on record our appreciation of Saudi financing through oil deferred payments and to China and Kuwait and other countries. Thank you at that time. The biggest problem I have had in managing the finances and the planning process in Pakistan has been the pressure of vested interests who keep demanding all kinds of uh, concessions, reliefs, exemptions, and favored pricing and so on and so forth. This has become almost like a market in Pakistan, and it has been very difficult to begin to say no against these powerful vested interests. So that has been one of our bigger problems. The other problem is the capacity of the ministries to take sophisticated, <clears throat> if you like, at the frontier type of policy decisions. The capacity is limited. There was a time way back in the 60s and 70s when Pakistan had developed the concept of an economic pool of civil servants who specialized in economic policy. And some of the big names you can you remember, Ghulam Isa Khan, who then became president of Pakistan, was a member of this pool. Then we had Said Qureshi, we had Basim Jafri, and so on. We have to go back to this concept of an economic pool in the civil service, which specializes throughout their lives in economic ministries and gets special training on economic policy and management. So Dr. Hafiz Pasha, you are actually associated with a university as Beacon House National University at the Department of Economics. Let me ask you, what are some of the skill sets that the university is really imparting in terms of you know, reading future economists to uh, deal with the chronic issues of Pakistan's economy? Well, I'm proud to say that we have a strong faculty. We have some of the leading economists in Pakistan who are associated with us. And our emphasis is on two particular dimensions. The first is focus more and more on the economy of Pakistan and not on generally some kind of an abstract treatment of development economics. We have all done enormous amounts of research on our economy, its problems, and how they can be resolved. And we are in the, perhaps, in fact, I'm pleased to report to you that after my last book on Charter of the Economy, I, about two weeks ago before I came here, we launched my new book on the leading issues in the economy of Pakistan. And that is the kind of a book which is used as one of our leading texts in the courses on Pakistan economy. So we teach development economics, but with a focus very strongly on the Pakistan economy. The other area of specialization of our, uh, of our business school, and which is of economics is a part of the business school, is very much on focusing on business and financial dimensions of problems faced by Pakistani companies. So for example, we have developed skills for projections and forecasting markets in a difficult environment. We have developed techniques for skillful project analysis at the down to the, if you like, 
a ground level of small or big projects. We have developed expertise for looking at the implications of changes in the world economy on Pakistan and therefore on an individual entity. So these are some of the very specialized skills that we have provided in our business school. So Pakistan, Pakistan, Pakistan is the focus. And therefore, the students we produce turn out to be much more relevant for local employers, both in the government as well as in the private sector. And we have been able to get many of our students in good positions. Dr. Afiz Pasha, we're down to our last two questions. And let me also ask you, and I think universities are once again sort of, you know, important in terms of equipping future economists with skill sets. Uh, we've seen economists, you know, often run into this problem in terms of impressing upon the politicians and the ruling elite to do the right thing when it comes to, you know, making, uh, making the right decision when it comes to, you know, economic decision making. Uh, unfortunately, We've often seen the politicians or the ruling elite, uh, you know, often reign supreme when it comes to these matters. How could universities like the BNU sort of teach those very important skills in terms of persuading ruling elite, in terms of making the right decision? And where do you think the BNU can actually make a difference? Again, a very useful question. You see, one of the things I realized uh, some time ago. Uh, in 2018, when the then new government took over, the first speech made by the opposition leader was when he sought a kind of consensus on a range of economic reforms and referred to that as the need for a charter of the economy. Now, having spent the better part of my life working on Pakistan's economy, both as a professor as well as a policymaker occasionally, I took upon myself the responsibility of preparing the first draft of a set of reforms which could be discussed in a larger forum where alternatives could be spelled out. And that book came out last year, in fact, 2021, when I distributed it to the all political leaders and the president of Pakistan was very interested and promoted this book. So this is the kind of work economists can do, prepare options of the policies to tackle serious problems, highlight the, the implications, the trade-offs and the impacts, and hopefully the political leaders, when they sit together, can begin to arrive at a consensus on what kind of reforms would help the people at large. This is the ideal vision of political and economic change that we have. So I have produced this book and it has been discussed a great deal over the last two years, but we are very far from arriving at any consensus yet on economic policies. My students are exposed very vividly to these set of issues through this book and other books that have been written by other authors. So our focus is very much on Pakistan today. What are the big issues? What do we need to do? What are the different options available to us to begin to tackle these problems? And what are likely to be the consequences for different sections of the population? So this is all very serious research that is going on at the Beacon House Center for Policy Research, which was uh, preceded earlier by the Institute of Public Policy at BNU. And we have done enormous amounts of research on reforms and policies for taking us over the next hump of growth. So this is what my students are doing and many of my students do their theses, even at the undergraduate level on some of the very topical issues of change in the Pakistani context. And uh, very humbly, if I may ask you, Dr. Hafiz Pasha, uh, what are some of the accomplishments that have actually been made by you know, the alumni from the BNU uh, especially the economists, and uh, where have they been uh, sort of, you know, leading different parts of the world when it comes to solving complex economic problems? Well, you see, uh, we started our, uh, a, a hardcore economics program about 15 years ago, and somewhat more recently, we have established the business school. And the business school to us is a broader umbrella 
or focusing on development and economic issues. I'll give you a few examples. One of my very good students uh, years ago who did her MPhil at BNU, she was nominated for, as if you like, the Rockefeller Fellowships. And she went to the USA, did her PhD, and now she was back in Pakistan, but has gone for some time teaching at Canada. That is one classic example of success. We have had a number of many other top students of mine who have since not only done postgraduate serious work, but also accomplished their PhDs. One of my recent uh, PhD uh, uh, qualifiers is now teaching at a, one of the leading universities in Lahore. So there is that dimension. The top students have moved into academics. They've gone into teaching. Then the second uh, group has gone essentially into the private sector and to some extent have been absorbed in the civil services of Pakistan. So generally, our students are able to do well. Unfortunately, you see what is now happening in Pakistan is because of the deep recession and the lack of growth in the economy, we have had to now really focus on skills on particularly those parts of the country where there is still need for additional employment and capacity. And we are focusing on that. And I'm pleased to report that the absorption of BNU students in the private sector has significantly improved over the last few years. Dr. Hafiz Pasha, thank you so much for joining this conversation. I think we, I personally stand educated on a lot of these issues, and I'm sure our audience would also find this of a lot of interest when it comes to economic matters and all matters related to economy on Pakistan. Thank you very much for an outstanding set of questions. I've enjoyed the, uh, uh, our process of interaction, and I look forward myself to seeing the response to this wonderful podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for staying with us through this conversation with Dr. Hafiz Pasha. Our team works very hard to make this work possible. And it would mean the world to us if you could like and share our content to show your support. And if you'd like to stay informed on upcoming podcasts and other work, please hit the bell icon.